Hi there, this is your personal CFO here back with another video and today I'll be beginning a new series here on my channel in which I discuss some of my favorite dividend yielding stocks for my own portfolio. Today I'll be specifically talking about the company ET, also known as Energy Transfer LP. Now before I get started, I think it's important to note that none of the content here in this video is intended to be construed as financial advice. Please do your own research and please get your own professional financial help for your own portfolio's needs. Today I'll be discussing some of the company's operations, what's new, what's going on with ET. I will give a brief oversight of the outlook in the gas and liquefied natural gas markets. I'll also talk about some of the company's ratios, as well as the weaknesses and risk factors that the company faces. Okay, first, let's just talk about what does energy transfer do for their business. They operate in the United States and Canada, and they have many different operating subsidiaries, but mainly their operations detail natural gas operations as well as crude oil, natural gas, liquids, and refined products, transportations, terminaling services, and acquisition and marketing activities, as well as NGL storage and fractionation services. In the natural gas operations, they do midstream and interstate transportation and storage, as well as interstate natural gas transportation and storage. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about how they make their revenue. I'm on page 10 of the annual report here. I'm just going to scroll down. Uh, first, they charge a demand fee, which is a fixed fee for the reservation of an agreed amount of capacity on the transportation pipeline for a specified period of time and which obligates the customer to pay a fee even if the customer does not transport natural gas on the respective pipeline. Two, a transportation fee, which is based on the actual throughput of natural gas by the customer. Three, fuel retention based on a percentage of gas transported on the pipeline. Or four, a combination of the three, generally payable monthly. As they state here, even if there is no gas going through the pipeline, they are still receiving their demand fee, as they notated here in this paragraph. Okay, next, we are going to jump here to their investor presentation from June of 2020 2022. And I think it's important to note, because this is critical, Energy Transfer does have a high debt load on their balance sheet. Uh, but they've worked very hard to reduce the long-term debt. They reduced just about $6.3 billion in 2021, as well as an additional $290 million in quarter one. They continue to strive to reduce their debt, and they're looking to hopefully increase the dividend in the future, um, even though they have a very significant dividend yield at the current moment. They also continuously make acquisitions. As you can see down here, they recently closed uh, their Enable Midstream acquisition, so that's big. They're continuously expanding, continuously growing. Now I'm going to briefly discuss why maybe it makes sense for you, for you or anyone to invest in ET based off ET's own personal opinion. Number one, ET's current yield as of June of 2022 was about 7.5%. Their estimated adjusted EBITDA is 12.2 to 12.6, which is substantial. And most of their earnings come from those fee-based margins of just about 90%, as we talked about. So they're not having to deal with a lot of short-term energy cost trading. It all has mainly to do with their fixed fees that are pre-established and pre-agreed upon with their customers. Okay, next I'm just going to quickly show you their operations. This is their operations map here on their website just to show you the scale of their operations. One, these are their natural gas pipelines. Please feel free to pause the video if you want to get a better look. They also have crude oil pipelines, pretty extensive as well. Refined products pipelines, as well as NGLs pipelines. They also have quite a few different terminals, quite a few different natural gas storage facilities. They also do processing and treating of the various products that they work with and fractionators. So as you can see, they have quite an extensive list of assets. Now, without further ado, let's also talk a little bit about their Lake Charles LNG project because I think this is a key project in terms of the growth of energy transfer. Now, this is a completely permitted um, planned growth project that has been completely cleared, unlike any other facility uh, planned project in the current midstream space. The main reason for that is because they're taking a pre-existing import facility that they already own and they're transitioning it, transitioning, transitioning it, excuse me, into an export facility, as you can see down here. So we'll just touch on that briefly. ET is developing a large-scale LNG export facility in Lake Charles, Louisiana. The project will convert Energy Transfer's existing Lake Charles LNG import and regasification terminal to an LNG export facility, providing a cost advantage over other proposed LNG projects on the Gulf Coast. Now, why am I such a large fan of LNG? 
This is just a simple graphic. Here's the current existing facility. Here are the three regasification terminals they plan to add, and this will be the completed Lake Charles LNG facility. Probably won't be finished until about 2026 or maybe a little bit there later. Now, why is LNG and gas important in this world economy? Number one, LNG and gas is expected to grow in demand uh, to, to help with the reduction of carbon emissions. So let's start off here. Asia will continue to drive global LNG demand growth. However, China becomes less important as a driver for LNG demand beyond 2035, and we'll see demand peak around 2040. South and Southeast Asia will take over as key demand drivers. Also, LNG demand is resilient. LNG demand grew by 1% in 2020, while global gas demand declined. Longer term, the share of LNG in the global gas supply will increase from today's 13% to 23% by 2050 as it meets demand growth and replaces declining pipeline and domestic gas. Approximately 400 million tons of additional liquefaction capacity is needed by 2035 and more than 200 million tons by 2050. So there's quite a lot of growth expected in the marketplace. Now this is just a quick graphic that I wanted to show to show that total peak gas demand will most likely peak out in the next decade and a half or so. So it's important to note that if you're going to invest in any sort of midstream or energy-based company that you know the risks this is one that I'm aware of. I'm, I'm very aware of my time horizon with this investment, but it's, it's important that you know as well um, when this gas may peak in demand because that could hurt profitability, it can hurt acquisitions, and it can intens intensify the competition in this marketplace. Also, here is a graphic from Shell from 2022. They also talk about some of the positives related to LNG specifically, so that's why I'm a big fan of the Lake Charles project that I previously spoke upon. They also support the idea that switching just 20% of coal-fired power to gas in Asia can potentially save 680 million tons of CO2 emissions every year. LNG is expected to meet over 75% of Asia's incremental gas demand by 2040. I'm not going to touch on the other points here, but please feel free to pause the video and look at any of the graphics I've shown you thus far. Okay, next. We'll talk a little bit about the ratios here, and I'll also show you the chart for energy transfer. Uh, but first things first, this is a market cap of $30 billion. That means that they are a large cap company. Uh, they bring in about $3 billion in income per year. Uh, they have a current dividend yield as of the end of day on July the 15th uh, of 8.15%, which is a great dividend yield. They also do have a very large debt to equity ratio with most of that debt being long-term debt. I would prefer that this number come down, but as you saw on the previous slide on their investor presentation, that they are reducing debt at a very quick pace. So I'm happy to see that, and I'm okay with the current debt-to-equity levels. Uh, they have a great price-to-free cash flow, as well as a price-to-sales. Uh, price me. Uh, the 4 PE is very competitive with the current competitors in the marketplace, so I'm quite okay with that number at this point. Uh, also, another point here is their payout ratio is very sustainable, with a just under 60% payout ratio. Uh, the current relative strength index is about 42 uh, so we'll go up then to the current chart just to show how much volatility has come out of this stock over the last, uh, we'll say, six to nine months. Uh, it's gone quite up due to the recent uh, inflation, to, due to the increased inflation and, and gas prices climbing due to the Russian-Ukraine uh, war. But also it's dropped quite a lot over the last just two, three weeks down to a level that we haven't seen in quite a long time here. So... Although it's kind of broken out of this channel, I expect it will probably bounce back up into the channel. And even if it stays down at these levels, I'm happy to buy it at the current price point. Okay, now we're going to move over to the risk factors that ET faces. This is page 51 of their annual report. Number one, they are prone to facing natural disasters. A lot of their assets are based just along the Gulf Coast, specifically in Texas. As many of you may be aware, that is a large uh, landing point for many large hurricanes. So that could certainly impact their uh, their revenues for a year or even longer if their assets were destroyed for a prolonged period of time. Also, they are prone to potential terrorist attacks. I know that seems far-fetched, but in the world that we live in today, I know energy infrastructure is a critical point for many countries, and that could certainly be a target for terrorist attacks. Also, as you can see down here in this statistic, about 11% of ET's workforce is covered by a number of collective bargaining agreements with various terms and dates of expiration. They could be prone to union disputes or strikes by their workers, and that could certainly inadvertently uh, affect their revenues for a prolonged period of time. 
Next, we're going to jump to the very next page on this annual report. Okay, we're now on page 52 of the annual report, the very next page, and I wanted to touch on this point here, product liability and litigation. This key point here is something to be mindful of. Along with other refiners, manufacturers, and sellers of gasoline, Sunoco is a defendant in numerous lawsuits that allege MTBE contamination in groundwater. Plaintiffs, who include water purveyors and municipalities responsible for supplying drinking water and private well owners, are seeking compensatory damages for claims relating to the alleged manufacture and distribution of a defective product. That contaminates groundwater and general allegations of product liability, nuisance, trespass, negligence, violation of environmental laws, and deceptive business practices. When you're putting pipelines in the ground, you're prone to facing pushback from the uh, one from the local residents, but also if you have issues with your pipeline, they can contaminate groundwater. So that is certainly another impact that ET has to face. Okay, next we're going to jump to the 53rd page of the annual report. This is a big one I found that I really thought was worth noting. As you can see here, a lot of their business is done in the Houston Shipping Channel. That has been a port that's grown quite a lot over the last several years and decades. However, if the port were to become overcrowded and contain too many vessels, which can restrict the flow of other cargo, increasing congestion could cause customers or potential customers to divert their business to smaller ports in the Gulf of Mexico which could result in lower utilization of ET's facilities. Now we're going to jump to page 54 of the annual report. As you can see here, ET does have about $50 billion in consolidated debt. That's an extremely exorbitant amount of debt for a company. However, in this current landscape, ET's done a great job of navigating their debt levels. However, the debt can certainly become a problem moving forward if they don't find ways to address it and to reduce it. So that was all I had for you today. If you like this video, please hit the like button. Please comment below if you have any thoughts of your own. And if you want to follow along for future videos, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you very much.